one of the most successful English footballers over the last two decades, uh, with 73 caps for his country. Uh, following a successful stint at Tottenham, he joined Arsenal in 2001, winning two Premier League titles, uh, including uh, being part of the legendary Invincibles team. Since his retirement from football, he has become increasingly involved in political activism. Please join me in welcoming him with a warm round of applause. Right. Right. I've got my uh, student bag as well. <laughs> right. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. <laughs> um, so I guess, I mean, uh, almost on the note uh, in the middle, like, uh, what was it being part, like, as a legend of, uh, of, of Arsenal and of football, what was it like being part of that uh, Invincibles team? I think f for me, um, you know, you don't start off like that. Uh, it's, um, you know, you, you start off thinking that you want to win the Premier League or Premiership. Uh, and uh, it's, it doesn't really come into your mind. So that's the first thing. Obviously, over time, as you, you're winning games, you're not losing, you still don't think that it's going to happen. You've got a good idea that you might win the, the, the Premiership or Premier League. Um, and it's only afterwards that you get so close. There was a game against, um, well, we had a few shaves anyway, because you need a little bit of luck, you need the right team, the right, the right chemistry, uh, not so many injuries, but you need a little bit of, bit of luck, like in most things in, in life. And yeah, you gotta earn that luck as well, you know, with, with hard work. Um, and then when it happens, it's, it's, it's incredible, you win it. But it's only afterwards that people you know, talk to you, say, hey, you, you went through the whole season, blah, 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 um, amazing, you beat a record that stood for, like, I don't know, like 100 years, um, you know, back in the days when there was only 12 teams in the league, and I don't think anyone was uh, professional, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great, uh, and it's only after, you know, 10 years plus that you realise, wow, what, a, what a, an achievement. Uh, but a lot of things have to go your way as well. Uh, it's not just a good team. Obviously, Manchester City are looking to kind of... They, they, they tried to do it last year, and they're probably <laughs> they probably are looking to try to do it this year as well. So um, if it's going to be any team to break that uh, uh, or join us, it, it'd be definitely Manchester City. Uh, and uh, like, how did you cope in, in, those, in those moments where you've gone a you've gone goal down, um, and obviously there's a lot of pressure... Uh, mm. How did you sort of dig deep to, to pull back at to like a draw or even a victory? You just say, Thierry, can you score a goal, please? <laughs> <laughs> or so, you know, someone would pop up and score a goal. And that's the beautiful thing, having a, a fantastic side. And, you know, sometimes maybe the forwards are not uh, doing it and you get someone to come off the bench. And uh, that's the beautiful thing. If you've got a, the right squad, the right chemistry, um, you know, you can always, and the right bench as well, guys who can come on and, and, and change the frequency of the game and give the defenders a little bit of problem with fresh legs and fresh ideas and, um, you know, some special players, you, you know, you, you can do something. And in that particular year, you know, we, we had that. We had all the ingredients to, uh, not to, you know, we, as I said before, we're not thinking of, you know, we want to be, you know, go the whole season. We just wanted to win the Premiership. Uh, and uh, speaking of uh, great players like Thierry, who is, uh, who is the best player in the squad or uh, the one that you just sort of said wow when, when you saw them play? There were so many, so many. Um, there was Sol Campbell, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in his own way. But there was like, you know, Robert Perez, um, Dennis Bergkamp, you know, obviously Henri, there's Patrick and Riera. Uh, fantastic kind of guys, um, you know, who, you know, titans of the game, you know. Um, and everybody had something different. You had, you know, even, say, Lundberg on coming off the wing, scoring his goals. Um, you know, I played with Tony Adams for the first year. He was, he was, a, he was, he was immense, uh, great, great captain. Martin Keown, you know, David Seaman, then Jans Lehmann came after, Ashley Cole, Laurent. So, um, you know, Ray Parlow as well. But it had a fantastic mix and, uh, you know, we, uh, we, 
we had an ultimate team. It's um, you know almost the I don't know like the perfect year, the, you know the, the the perfect game. Uh, for us that particular year and then just it's just wonderful to have all those players around you so I can't just say one player is this is the player obviously everyone always leads to Thierry and maybe Dennis Bergkamp and Robert Perez but you know you, you need these other guys to make a team and um, it's incredible and, and so that was very much the, the glory days of uh um, of Arsenal, especially for you know, people of this, uh, of, like our, our generation. Mm. Um, so you can, I guess, understand probably the frustration. Probably don't remember people in here, probably don't remember, do <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's I been mean, a long time. I mean, I, I guess that, that, that leads on to my next question in terms of uh, the frustration that maybe uh, Arsenal fans feel, uh, feel nowadays. And uh, what do you think about platforms like uh, Arsenal Fan TV and um, some of the fans, <laughs> uh, the way sort of fans discuss and talk about, or, or talked about like Wenger out and mm. other issues about the Arsenal team at the mm. moment? You know, we're in the, we're in the, you know, this is the days of, um, you know, social media. Um, people want to get their points across. Um, there's a platform. Um, you know, Arsenal TV is a big platform. Uh, I know they've had problems with the hierarchy of Arsenal. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just because the frustrations. Um, you know, they were very vocal about Arsenal. Uh, you know, it's understandable. There's a lot of people were vocal about Arsene, but then his other side was was quite uh, supportive, supportive of Arsene Wenger. So, in the end, it just in the end, I think in the end, it just came down to results that um, pushed the hierarchy to say maybe it's time to go in a new direction. So uh, I don't think it was the fans. Um, I, I think if if uh, Arsenal would have won an, another F, you know, FA Cup or, or, or maybe uh, won the UEFA Cup, I think Arsenal would probably be still here, you know? Um, so, you know, the, it's, the, it's, it's now. This is what it's all about. You know, people want to be vocal, uh, want to get their point across, um, and everyone has their opinion, uh, as long as it doesn't really... It's, it's an opinion on, on the football and it doesn't really... Um, uh, go, goes further than that, above that, other than football, um, everyone has their opinion, and yeah, rightly so. Uh, and uh, you touched upon uh, sort of getting a new, new manager for a new outlook. Um, what, what are your aspirations for football management? Well, you know, I'm busy, busy working. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully in the next couple of days, I should have... Uh, um, interesting and more things to talk about that. But the main thing is, I went away with England under 21s. That was uh, fantastic for me. Um, it's great to kind of be back in the England fold. Uh, they've got some fantastic players going, coming uh, through the ranks, and uh, it's nice to see that. I, I, I enjoyed myself. I came alive. I learned a lot um, about the uh, the whole regime, the whole. You know, the FA has put a lot of money behind the scenes. It's just incredible now. The, uh, the funds uh, to support uh, the, the young players coming through. And it's more of a club now, because back in the days, you know, you, you couldn't really get into, say, the, definitely the first team. If you was playing a kind of a lowish kind of club in the first division, definitely in the, uh, the, the championship or the old second division, you would get nowhere near... Um, uh, the first team. The only kind of guy in my time who got close was uh, Steve, Steve Ball. He used to play for Wolves and he was fantastic. And he was the only one who, who was in the second division or championship now who got into the England side, but he was scoring ridiculous amount of goals uh, <laughs> week in, week out and every season. So he got his chance. But other than that, no chance. Now it's different because they need to they understand the pressures of, of, of uh, the, the, you know, the the league now, Premiership, Premier League, so to speak, um, it's different now. Some of the young players can't get in because some of the owners want, uh, want their own style, they want to pay for instant kind of success, so that pushes the pressure on the manager to kind of say, look, we've got to have this instant, instant success, or so to speak. Uh, everyone hopes that, but not everyone gets that. But um, I think so, the, the byproduct, not byproduct, the... the uh, the, um, uh, the downside of that is some of the young players can't develop in the, in, the, in the top league and they are getting frustrated. 
Some have gone to Holland and Germany to, to kind of learn and get experience and get that kind of that the man's kind of football into their system and get the experience. And they're, and they're doing really well now, doing really well. So uh, I think now, I, I think the future is if it carries on this way, you, you'll see a lot more 19, 20 year olds into mainland Europe and playing football. For sure. Uh, and so there's a lot of support for young players coming through. And uh, how, what steps do you think the FA should take to help the young players who aren't, aren't making it through um, in terms of sort of uh, mental health support and for those who don't quite uh, make it into a team who are let go? I think for me, they are doing that with the teams now. So they are, it's, it's a club now. So they understand that it's a different landscape now, football, um, in the top divisions. So they are helping the young players and saying, even if you're not playing, we, we believe in you, come and play for us. We know about your talent. We've, we've trained with you uh, over a course of six months or you've come from the 17s and now you're kind of 19, 20, you're still part of our plans. And that is, that's, the, that's the fundamental thing has changed now. It's a club, it's almost um, taken taking the players in, helping them, giving them confidence, giving them another platform. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Don Solanke, he, he, you know, when I was over with, uh, with the 21s, he's hardly played, but he scores like four goals in two games. You know, he's a fantastic player. Uh, 10 years ago, I think he'd be starting his career for sure in one of the top sides. It's so different now. Um, and there's countless players in the same position, so they, they've changed the, the whole kind of um, the whole system. Really, the whole system's changed, completely changed. So it's, it really is, you know, giving them a platform to say we still believe in you, play for England, and they're all high level, and the, and the young the young guys are all responding to it. It's, it, it really has changed. It is, it is like a club now. It's not an England team. It's more of an England club. Uh, so, I mean, clearly the FA is taking many steps to help young players, but there are certain things that I'd imagine are very, very difficult to prepare for, um, such as, uh, I mean, you transferred from Spurs to Arsenal. Mm. Um, and such a long time ago. How old are you? <laughs> uh, I'm 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 <laughs> that. It's only internet that keeps it going. <laughs> um, but but uh, how do you sort of, how do you prepare or cope with um, sort of the, the targeted criticism and uh, almost uh, uh, an abuse and now it is also even death threats for doing and considering such things? I think, you know, the players have, you know, I think mentality, I think the players have changed a little bit now. Um, I just think society has changed as well. Um, you know, back in the days, you, 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 it's almost the characters are now becoming the managers. And I think the players are becoming, they don't want to kind of, you know, get anything wrong, um, don't want to step out of line. And, and that's, a, oh, that's okay, that's proper. That's, that's courteous, that's um, respect. But sometimes when, when they need to stand up for something, that, it's almost, that's vanishing. It's like, it doesn't, it almost, you know, you, you, I'm not saying they stand for anything, but it, it's almost, they do not want to cross the line for anything. So I think it's just society. So my time, I think people like me and, 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 and people who, who are around my generation and before me, I think that type of character is, um, I don't know, I, I don't think, um, if it is there, I don't think it's allowed to flourish, uh, or it's completely gone out of the game. I think it's a different world now. And, and, uh, There's criticism is still there, but I think the characters of, of the game are, are slowly kind of, not ebbing away, yeah, ebbing away. And that's also criticism of the current Arsenal team. Why, why do you think there are fewer big personalities and big characters in, in modern football? Why there isn't? Yes. Uh, I said before, it's like society and, and the whole kind of um, regime, the whole kind of setup around football now. I think, I think players are not allowed to kind of do those kind of things. And, I, and also, I think players don't want to do those things. They don't want to, you know, um, fall out the pub and of, you know, a, a nightclub four or five days a week or whatever. Um, I don't think, you know, they, they want to do those kind of things anymore. And a lot of them are kind of, you know, switched on and, and, and you know, their heads are screwed on and they want to do things properly, want to have sleep right. There's a, obviously, they want to enjoy themselves, but I think, you know, they drink less as well. Um, I just think environment it has changed. It really has changed now. That those kind of guys um, that football uh, had in abundance, they are still there, but they're very rare now. 
Uh, and speaking of change or things that uh, need to change, um, what, what steps do you think uh, both society and uh, f f footballing bodies can take to sort of really kick racism out of the game? Because I know you've been quite mm. uh, vocal about that. I think for me, I, I, obviously I've, you know, I've been vocal in the, um, in the, in the past and um, I think there's, you know, the, I, think the, I think some of the authorities are doing a wonderful job. There, there is always a bit to, there's always, you know, you've got to keep at it. That's the main thing. If you, as soon as you think it's kind of um, under control, that's when it's out of control, I feel, anyway. Sometimes if you start thinking it's, it's fine and it, it starts breeding, it starts coming back, uh, I think they've got to watch out when they go lower leagues. Uh, I think that is not, not, I'm not saying police properly, but I think people will be more vocal and uh, in a sense that reporting those kind of, uh, uh, those comments uh, on, uh, on the terraces and things like that. I think there's no place for that in, 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 a, in a sport of, or any sport really, or any, you know, life. Um, you, you don't need that kind of uh, rhetoric around you and I think uh, sports should be, should be kind of cleaned up and it is getting cleaned up because you want families at, at football and kids and things like that. You don't want the people to kind of grow up in, the, in a certain way you, or frightened of going to, to the club or being indoctrinated in a certain way. Of, this, is how you, this is how you show your, your, your anger to this player, whatever. If you, if, you, if you bring a kid at four years old, five years old, by the time 15 years old and they've, they've had that around them, they almost think it's just normal. So it's all about, you know... Uh, having you know, good characters around and people saying, look, this is unacceptable now. Um, it's sport, it's football. Um, we, we don't want that. I know other countries have their own problems uh, at different degrees and different levels. Um, but, you know, England is... The UK was... Well, I'm just looking at England. They've done wonderful things. There's, it's not perfect, but they've done a hell of a lot. Uh, and do you think, uh, to what extent do you think it affects the coverage of certain players, like um, sort of Raheem Sterling in particular? Mm. I think for me, you know, I think with, with, uh, with those guys, one thing has changed now is that they can, they can tell their own story now. Back in the days, you couldn't tell your own story because, you know, place things like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter didn't exist. So you had to, if you want to explain, explain yourself, you had to go through the people who were kind of um, at a, you know, they were the key masters. You know, how, you know, you talk to them and they will, find, they will say, well, I want this to come out or that to come out. Or we do an article and then you see the article on the weekend and it's like, you know, half of it's changed. So now, I think with, 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 with the players, they can actually put out a statement because they've got millions of followers and things like that, and they can, it's almost like the horse's mouth. So, in a way, it's kind of turned around, and they, they can, if you do it in the right way, can it, you can explain, if something's happened, you can explain in your own way, in your own tone, um, and hopefully that can appease or, or uh, you know, satisfy whatever's gone on. Uh, thank you very much for that. And I think that's probably enough uh, from me because I'm sure there are many questions from the, from the floor. So if you'd like to ask uh, us all the questions, raise your hand and wait for us to come to you uh, with a microphone. That uh, one went up very quickly here. Thanks, so. Um I just wanted to ask you about Rio Ferdinand's comments about the, your golden generation of the England team and how rivalries influence, influence that team. What was your perspective in terms of the internal rivalries of that team? What, in general? Yeah, just of the, that England team from, say, 2002. I think, I think, um, I think the main, not the main problem, I just think, especially with the, I think with the Liverpool and the Man United guys, it, it was, it, it, it took far too long for the, not the anger, but the professional kind of jealous or, or I don't know. It, it just took a long time for it to kind of ebb away. And it was, um, and in time it ebbed away, we, we were knocked out of a competition by then. So I think that was the main, and, and because they were deep, um, those rivalries would, would, would not just go football, it would go from area to area. Um, and it, it is so deep that it, it, it just took far too long to get rid of. 
Um, everyone played with each other, but I think the obviously Rio was alluding to it, it, if you're just five percent off, that can, that can make the difference in the, in the competition. Um, it for me, it just took a long time for it to kind of. Yeah, and you just need to bring everyone, especially international, you need to bring everyone, and also they had big characters as well. So you had big characters, big egos, top, top players, and it just took a long time for that, for them to be, you know, friends and hug and to say, let, look, let's, let's get on with it. And, and, and that conversation uh, didn't happen. And, and, and maybe in time, if you look back, maybe the, maybe the manager could have done, a, the managers over the time could have done a lot more to kind of break that down or... or understand that a bit better. If they understood that a bit better um, and, and kind of got underneath and, and got rid of that, I think that would, that would, have, been, that would have helped. I think uh, the managers have kind of just allowed it to kind of um, get on and then hopefully it would disappear or we'll just get through it through talent. But I think sometimes the, you do need that togetherness. Um, and it just, for me, it just took a, a long, far too long to, to get rid of. Thank you for that. Uh, over there, the find. Uh, hi, Sol. Thank you. Um, uh, one of my clearest memories of my childhood is when I was 10, walking home in Paris after mm. the game um, in 2006, <laughs> crying uh, to point. my hotel sort room. Point. Far too sore to talk um, about. <laughs> what are your memories of that Champions League campaign that, and that final? And would you put that final as the biggest disappointment uh, in terms of one particular yeah. moment of your career? I think, I, think, I think for Arsenal, really, as well. I think um, uh, you get, what, just over 10 minutes away from, from winning, you know, the biggest uh, club competition in Europe. Um, and you've missed a, a hat full of chances. And um, you just feel, oh, God... Larson comes on uh, and, and completely changed the game. Um, I just wish uh, the AR was around because the first goal was offside. So, <laughs> um, you know, and it, you do need a little bit of luck sometimes. You know, I, I, I watched the counters other finals. Um, and you know you got the famous one uh, with uh, Liverpool and um, AC Milan, you know, dead and buried three 0 and they come back and like, you know, you know uh, Chelsea versus uh, Bayern Munich. I mean, it's, and the Man United when they when when they won the trouble, you know, I think Effenberg hits the hits the post or bar that goes in game over. You know those kind of moments you just need to go your your, your way. We had enough chances to. I thought if Barcelona had our chances, I think it would have been like 3-1. We just need we just needed one of them. I mean, Barcelona was just thinking, when are they, when are they going to score? And obviously we didn't score, and they came came and they and, and they, they beat us in the last 10 minutes. So uh, it's tough because that you know you you just don't know when you're going to have that. You know, you're not at man you're not at say Man United at that time or Barcelona or Real Madrid. You know that if you spend five years at Bar Barcelona or Madrid or Man United at the at the height of the career, you know they're gonna you you you're gonna get say two or three chances to, or even you know even sometimes four chances, <laughs> or in some cases five chances to to win the European Cup. So um, not every club um, is in that kind of position. Some clubs can spend that type of money but not not get to the final. Um, and so when, you, when you're so close, you're so close and, and you've missed a hat full of chances, whoever, whoever's missed it and, you know, whatever, uh, it, it's, it's a tough, tough pill to kind of uh, to swallow. Uh, thank you for that. I'll uh, just show up here in the front. Uh, in the last few years, you've been getting involved in politics a little bit, um, but now it seems like you're looking forward to... Oh, it's all gone. That's all gone. <laughs> it's taken me two years to shake that off. <laughs> <laughs> Is it something that you'd be interested in oh. carrying on in future? Um, mm. uh, and also, no. what's your thoughts on Theresa May's Brexit deal? Um, I don't know. I, I'm out of the game. I'm way out of it. Um, I, I, I think for, for me, it's, it's, all about, it's all about football now. I'm totally focused on that. Um, 
I think with uh, with politics, it, it was mostly it's mostly just London, really. I just want, I love London, and I wanted to help out London, and uh, I've you know I've done lots of charity stuff for for for, for various things in, in London. So and I just want London to work um, on a kind of a charity kind of level, really. And if I could help in any way, you know, I you know I would look at the situation and I'll, I'll help if I ca if I could. So that's that's really where I'm at, really. Um, I've studied for three and a half years now to, to, to start my coaching and managing, and I'm almost on the brink to kind of, you know, go on my path. I think politics, I think with politics, you, you, you've got to be a certain type of person to, to, to get on, and I think uh, politics is, uh, is very intrusive, and if you're, if you're happy with that and you want to be, you know, every single thing about you uh, known or, or, or looked at, uh, from just a low level to a really deep level, um, then it's fine. And if you want to make a difference, um, I think it's a, it's a great thing to, to be a servant for, for the public so, and the nation. So I think if, you, if you're that way, that way inclined, I think it's great. Uh, for me, um, it wasn't. I wanted to help London, and that was really it, really. Um, and I'm kind of fully into my football stuff. And Brexit is... Uh, it's too, it's too complicated. I can talk all day long. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, over here at the front. So there's some guys at the back as well, I've seen. So, so. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> An another bitter gooner here. Um, we've talked a lot about the Invincibles, but of course you also played in the game where our unbeaten record was lost, or mm. perhaps stolen by uh, Mike Riley. Well, if you had, I think if, go on, finish. Yeah, no, I was just going to ask you about your memories of that day. Kind of, did you foul Wayne Rooney, or did he dive? Who threw the pizza at Sir Alex Ferguson? <laughs> what was said in the dressing room afterwards, kind of thing? Can you reveal all? Mm, no, <laughs> but that's what I'm talking about, the characters. You just ain't, get, you ain't getting that anymore. I don't know, you just, it's just not, it doesn't exist. Those people. I think for me, um, uh, I think it's, uh, Referees, I think if they were more... Uh, now referees are more uh, switched on now. So that was probably the beginning of... of uh, not the beginning, that was... You know, how it happened. A big game, tight game. Uh, I think if it was 10 years on, the referee would have seen that. Uh, you know, I, it was like a matador. I kind of had my kind of, you know, uh, red cape there and I kind of took my leg away and it just, he just just kind of, I don't know, did a basketball kind of uh, uh, um, um, action and he fell over and, and you know, the referee uh, thought it was a uh, penalty. I, I didn't touch him, I pulled my leg away. I think now referees are more twitched on to that now. So I don't think that would happen, so blatant. Um, I'm, not say, I'm not saying it, it, it's completely eradicated, but I think the referee would have been more uh, switched on. And if you've got the playback and things like that, all those kind of things can help players in those scenarios. Um, but, you know, it's, it's academic now, it's, it's gone. But, um, yes, I think, you know, it's, I didn't touch him. And then pizzas, I don't know, I can't remember who threw the pizza. You know, is it Pizza Hut, is it Domino's, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's home, you know, one of the home, home baked ones, who knows. <laughs> I think, anyway, I think it's out there. I think everyone knows who's done, who, who threw the pizza. I think everyone knows. Yeah, I think it's, fa it's Fabregas. <laughs> yeah, just here in the middle. Uh, I want to ask you a question about your transfer from Tottenham to Arsenal. Um, I've got a few close friends who are Spurs fans who are still very, very upset about How old are they? Uh, 22. My God. Um, they, Do you know how long ago it was? So, so the, <laughs> well, this, this guy thinks it's the most traumatic experience of his childhood. And At two years old? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, um, well, you must, you must I, think that's the, I think that's the, that's the main thing. Is like, you know... I'll let you finish. Go on, can you? Uh, so you must have known it would be controversial. So I wanted to ask you, what, what was your thinking in terms of making that switch between two really good rivals, and why did you go for Arsenal in particular? Actually, I didn't think it was going to be controversial. When you're 24, 25, how old are you? 21. 21. Are you thinking the same like, you, like maybe, I don't know, when you're 10? Um, or 15? No, you're not thinking. So every every year, so maybe if I was say 
I don't know, 30, two, three kids, blah, blah, blah. I may have thought it in a totally different way. But if you're looking to win, you're looking to kind of uh, better yourself, um, you think in a different way, totally different way. Um, and it's such a long time ago. I mean, you can't... Uh, I think that, as I said before, the only thing that keeps it going is the internet. If this happened maybe, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 35 years ago, people are not talking about it. I think, so, I don't know, maybe it was traumatic and people like to kind of, I don't know, stoke it up, you know, Derby coming round, blah, 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 and then it all, all comes, comes out. Um, you know, when someone is, you know, say two or three years old, I mean, who, who, do you remember what you was doing at three, four years old? <laughs> I don't know. Nobody. So I don't know how... The, it's obviously been passed on for, 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 for someone to say, oh, well, what a bad thing to happen, but you actually don't remember it. That's, that's, the, clever, that's the kind of weird thing about it. I can understand someone who is maybe, I don't know, 40 years old, but someone who is 20 and it didn't even, it, you know, they weren't even watching TV, and it, it, that side really is quite uh, um, perplexing for me, you know, when it, when it comes to feeling and, oh, it really traumatic, because they wasn't even around. You know, they were around, but they were, you know, in a cot or, 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 or something. It's, it's like, you know, how could I, you know, hurt you or, or the feeling of moving? It, it, that side is kind of, you know, when you look at it, when you look at it and you break it up and you really look at it, that person, your friend, sorry, I, I, I'm being, is it your friend? So I'm being, I'm being, no, hopefully I'm just being respectful. You know, when you look at it and you feel it, then you go back and say, wow, yeah, he, he, how's he feeling upset? He, you know, he's two, three years old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, so that's, you know, I can understand, you know, someone is 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, I can understand that. But uh, I think for me, it's all about, you know, it was a different era then. And I was, I was 24, 25. Um, hungry for success, uh, just really totally kind of despondent with, with the lack of with, with progression. And, um, you know, I wanted to, wanted to win, and, uh, and obviously I, I did win. Yes, it hurt a lot of people on the way, and, uh, and some people will forgive me, some people won't forgive me, or whatever. You know, who, who's liked by everyone in the world? No, you know, I think the main thing is, as long as you know where you're going in life, um, and you're focused, and you're happy, and you, and your, you know, your family, and all those kind of things, and you're, you're kind of moving forward. I think that's that's what it's all about, really. Um, and it's such a long time ago. Are you, are you going to be still talking it 30 years ago? 30, another 10 years from now? I don't know. Hopefully not. Hopefully people can move on. Tottenham can move on. The fantastic side now. Where they're going? New stadium, new players, Harry Kane, the lot. I mean, so much to kind of be happy about. Why look at the past? It's all about looking forward. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm just a question over there at the end. Hi, Saul. Uh, mm. I just wanted to say, what do you think should be done to encourage more BME managers? Managers? Yeah, uh, ma managers in the, in the top league. And do you think that the Rooney rule has been, um, or will be sufficient to tackle this problem? Um, <laughs> For me, there's, there's a, this, is the, this is the vex kind of you know, question or scenario. And, you know, no one knows what to kind of do. As, um, you know, some people are sticking their heads in the sand. Some people are actually saying, hey, we've got a problem here. Um, I think, I think there's, a, there's a mixture of players in there. I think the government being involved after the last, say, two years have been very vocal. Um, the FA have responded. Um, it just takes time. It, 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 I feel football is, is, is one of the sports that take, a, take forever to kind of, you know, um, change and, and kind of be flexible. A lot of other, you know, you can, you can look, at that, look at football in, 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 in that way in so many, in so many ways. Like for instance, um, psychology and things like that. You know, the only just now grasping, really grasping the psychology in sport. I mean, you go tennis, athletics, ice hockey, American football, all these other sports, archery, they've had sports psychologists for years, years. And it's not, it's not because, 
you, you have a psychologi psychologist in, in, in your midst, in your, in your team, or someone visiting you, that you're mad? I mean, that's the problem. That was, that was the stigma. If you were seeing a psychologist, sports psychologist, who's been, you know, um, gone through all the uh, proper, uh, proper kind of uh, tests and, and, and got a fantastic kind of resume and, and really, you know, up for it, he or she, it's, you know, it was, a, it was a problem. Oh, God, he's seeing someone or they're seeing someone. They must be, must be crazy. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the kind of environment that was, you know, existing and, and, and probably still exists in certain corners or lower leagues and things like that. But I think for me, you know, sports psychologists and things like that is, is, is all about going forward. So with the BME, uh, I think the government getting involved with the FA have, you know, they, they, they said two, twice, I think, um, uh, in Parliament said a few things to, to move along uh, uh, the FA. And then they have moved along now in, in the sense that I've been in, you know, one kind of initiative. I don't really like calling it a, a scheme, but initiative and going to under 21s, um, which was fantastic for me to, to see what's happening behind the scenes. And a few various other players, I saw Titus Bramble there with, with I think, the under 20s. Um, countless other players of of uh, have, have been involved from, from that type of background. And I think it's all about what, what you need is, it, you know, it's a scheme now, but all of a sudden, and I, I, I would like it to become just a normal kind of scenario, and it just becomes normal. It, there's no scheme attached to it. There's no kind of peripheral kind of treatment. It's just including everybody and not excluding. There's talent everybody, there's talent everywhere. And the problem is, is, is I think, a lot of, not only in, I don't think only in football, I think it's in general, in a lot of working uh, environments, that the profiling and, uh, you know, selecting and, you know, people who look like you or whatever, you're going to more employ them. I, you know, football's, this, you know, fo you can't discount football. Football is like that. And I think a lot of business areas and, and the city and various other jobs, like, say, I don't know, the state agents kind of environment, all those kind of things, builders or whatever, you know, it, it's not just look, look, football, it, it's society. So I think as long as people are open and start realising that talent is everywhere and it, it doesn't matter, matter where you're from or religion or, or colour, you know, that it, it, talent is everywhere. And now, you know, I think the FA and football are slowly, slowly getting it. And uh, hopefully, you know, chances and people just look beyond the colour and just say, I'm a manager. Forget what I look like, I'm a manager. And that's what it's all about. That's how it should be. And thank you very much for that question. Uh, just over here. Thanks, Sol. Um, if you had the choice between playing for Arsenal or Tottenham today, who would you rather play for? Oh, my God. And oh, how, these questions. How oh, my do, God. I don't well, know what to do now. Let's have a little see, drink. Uh, oh. How do you see the rivalry panning out between those two, two teams in the near future? Tottenham are in some really good recent run of form, arguably the best striker in the world. <laughs> Unai Emery's come in, um, or one of the best. You know, Emery's come in and he mm. looks possessed and there seems to be more cohesion in the team. Mm. They're playing much better, 17 games unbeaten. Mm. So what do you see in the future for these two I teams? I feel, you know, what I feel is going to happen is, is that homegrown players who, who kind of kept that rivalry going, it, it, it is... It's not as, you know, there's not many players who can keep it going. It's, it's going to become, you know, like a high-level football game now. The rivalry is with the fans. It's with the fans. But the players, it, 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 you haven't got, say, I don't know, say seven players on each side who have grown up, you know, maybe two, three miles from the, from the club or, or being with the club for years. You know, the, some of them have come from around the world. I think now... The rivalry is, is the, about the talent, intensity, it's another game, it's a high-level game, and I think that has taken over than the rivalry. You're not getting people sliding tackles, elbows, you know, fighting for every inch on the pitch. It's, it's a high-level football game now, and, and I think that's how it's, more, it's moved into that. But I think the rivalry is, is, is with the, um, as always will be, the fans. Because they're, they're the ones who have grown up and with, with that club. Uh, if it's you know down the road or their mum and dad were, were, were fans of 
you know, of the club, and it, they've passed it on. So that side, I think, is, is the intense side, and I think it's just a high-level football game. Going forward, I think, you know, um, uh, with Emery coming in, has changed, the rhetoric has changed, he, he's more detailed on the defence, which they really needed uh, uh, to, to kind of, um, uh, the players to kind of be a bit more focused on, on where they are when they're not attacking and they're kind of in the right positions. And obviously Tottenham has increased uh, over the years, obviously they didn't bring in a lot of players in uh, this season, but they've got a solid side, new stadium, they've got a bright future, they've got a solid team uh, going forward. It's just now, the two teams now are, are, are Manchester City and, and, and Liverpool. Those, you know, they're, they're amazing now. Great managers and, and good funds. And, and the guys at the top, they're willing to put their money where their mouth is, both sides. You know, Fenway with, with, with Liverpool, they've done it with, uh, in Boston. They're always willing to kind of go, to, uh, go and, and go for it. They've, they've bought Liverpool and, the, and they carry on the same. Obviously, the guys in Manchester City just want to win and dominate. So it's, uh, it's healthy to see that at least there's two. It'd be nice if another two, three can come in and, and really mix it up and, and take points of each other because it seems like at the moment, Man City have just, you know, Rolls Royce are steaming away with just rolling, rolling everyone uh, uh, over with, with, with the style. And also, you know, that they've got the quality and depth of players and a great manager and Liverpool are there as well. So... Um, I just wish the you know Tottenham Arsenal would would uh, would join join forces not join forces together no but <laughs> join uh, join in that attack of trying to kind of be be top dog in, uh, at the end of the year be great I think competition breeds success and, and it also keeps it kind of interesting for for everyone out there. Thank you for that. Uh, just over here. Hi, Saul. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm interested to know, I know that obviously play, playing with the Invincibles is unbelievable and you achieve some great things, but how does your uh, success with Portsmouth and captaining them to the FA Cup rank among those achievements? I think with Portsmouth, um, you know, it's going down to Portsmouth, it was, um, most people thought that's it. It's, uh, you know, you go down there, you know, down to the south coast and uh, see you later. You know, your career's over and, or you, you're not too bothered about um, winning or you, you just kind of, I don't know, um, consolidating yourself and uh, ticking over to, you know, to the end of your career. But, um, you know, I've never been like that. And, uh, you know, Harry was very clever. He brought a lot of experience there and he brought a lot of guys who still had something to prove. And that's, that's, that's the important thing. If you've still got something to prove to yourself, not to other people, but to yourself, that, that's, I think that's key. And he brought a lot of those guys together and um, you know, he's been successful over the years. But that particular, that particular uh, year, um, he was very successful with, with, um, with us winning the FA Cup, which was uh, you know, fantastic for me. And, and I don't know how, you know how it feels. If you go, to, if you at a, uh, one of the big five clubs, you expect it to win. And then you win, it's great feeling, it's fantastic, and it's like, wow, yeah, we've won and we've another notch, and you know, we're, we're FA Cup or League Cup, or you know, we won the league. But to win the FA Cup there was, was incredible because you're not expected to win. There's so many other clubs that spend tons of money and not got to the final and not won FA Cup, of not won anything for 50 years. You know, it's unbelievable, and they spend a phenomenal amount of money every year, and they've got fantastic crowds and great stadiums and unbelievable training grounds, and not won anything, got nowhere, maybe got to final, but not won it. So for, for us to go down there, you know, the training ground's not the best, the, the ground is old, you know, really fantastic kind of, you know, back in the day stadium with fantastic fans, and to win there was just so special. It was, for me, it was... Um, it meant more because, you know, there was a game against, uh, I think it was the quarterfinals against Man United and, um, uh, away. And we played Man United, I think, two, three weeks before. And I think they just walloped us. I think Ronaldo scored this, you know, dipping free kick. And we said, oh, my God, you know, it's all over. And then we've got them in the FA Cup quarterfinals. So we're thinking, oh, my God, we've got to really, you know, it's, it's one of those days. So what's, it, what's the number going to be? But we've got, we had fantastic character. And... Um, it's quite funny, you know, just talking to a couple of people, Man United um, were offered, oh, do you fancy getting some uh, home tickets, I mean, away tickets for the replay? And I, 
it's not going to be, we're gonna, it's going to be done today. Um, it's quite funny, it was so arrogant uh, about it. But we just turned up and we played an amazing game. It's probably one of the best ports of games ever. I mean, I was full of emotion. I was crying after the game because you, you look, you're down to lose. And, and the, the betting books and the form is saying, you're losing. You're losing today. You're going to get two, three, nil, or whatever, done, you know, Man United in the, uh, in the semifinals. But we said no. And, and there were so many warriors, warriors out there, and the team played fantastic. <laughs> they even went one man down, and we, you know, we scored the penalty. But that's the beautiful thing about the FA Cup. It, it will just keep on happening. You know, you get, a, you know... Um, a Goliath, and, and then you get a David, and, 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 and it, come, it keeps on coming. And that's what the, the beautiful thing about the FA Cup, you always got a chance on the one-off game. And we had a one-off game, and we, we played our socks off, and uh, okay, we had some bumps and, uh, along the road in the game, but uh, there were some her historic uh, uh, performances on, 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 the, on that <laughs> afternoon. So Portsmouth is, is definitely up there because... We weren't, you know, especially for that game, we weren't down to win. We, it was Man United all the way, and we, we proved, proved them wrong. And we proved that, you, you, that that's the beautiful thing about football. You, anything can happen. And, um, and I still like that mentality in, in, in the UK, especially England. You still have that chance of, of beating that big team. And, uh, and, that's the, and that's the great thing. You know, I started playing with football in the streets, and you'd play some older kids, but, you know, you... you, you there was still the possibility that you could beat them, even though there were you know, the giants against you. you know? and, and that's what I like about football. You still, you've got a chance. Uh, it's a leverer, and that's what, that's what I like it. You know, you, you, everything gets shifted out of the way, and it's all about talent, a little bit of luck, things like that, and uh, organisation, and, and that's the beautiful thing about football. Thank you very much for that. Uh, just over here. Hello, Sol. Uh, Hello. Thank you very much. I'm from Chile, so Hi. you have been a great uh, mm. figure for, for us. I also play a defender, so um, I'm a sports fan, so, but I'm the ones who still admire you despite <laughs> of anything. Um, I still show my son videos of you, so, so you have a... Not videos of me starting another push against uh, Croatia, surely. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is... Um, uh, related to a, a big problem with the football players in Latin America, at least, is that um, a lot of them come from very poor neighborhood mm. and they started earning millions of dollars mm. and, and the football player career is not that long and, and after they finish their career, uh, some of them are, are many times broke. It happened mm. to a news uh, one month ago about Ronaldinho, things like that. Do you think... Uh, when I did it, I was broke. Yeah, that, no, that was... I think, probably, he, has, I think he has a lot of money on his Instagram. I saw him at one hotel, I think he's doing all right. Uh, he's got two wives, that, yeah. I think it's okay. But, <laughs> but, but uh, do you think FIFA and, uh, and the team management uh, are doing enough to take care about players, not only as uh, in the field, but also uh, protecting them from from these things, uh, sometimes when they are young, educating mm. them. We see the case of Dembélé, for instance, in Barcelona. What do you think about that? What, what do you think uh, FIFA is doing enough, or the teams are doing enough? What do you I, think could do, uh, they could do? I think, in the, yeah, good question, you know, because you know, this is the, uh, a question that has, has been with us for a long time. So I think for me, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, a lot of the guys are, are from poor backgrounds. Not all from poor backgrounds. Some of them from middle class. But there's a large majority from poor backgrounds. And, um, and definitely when you go to, say, places like uh, Africa and South America, you have a lot of talent. That, you know, that, that, that ratio is, is definitely uh, uh, high. But um, I think in the UK, they are starting to help kids. You know, I, I recently, I, I was, uh, not recently, but I was um, working or doing a little bit of QPR and some, with some of the youth. And, and I, I saw the, the, the lengths that the club was um, bringing in people, bringing in accountants, bringing in lawyers, things like that, just to kind of, and obviously education as well, 
uh, just bringing in uh, 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 elements into, into the under 17s, under 18s, just to give them a little bit of help on, on kind of the business matters or, or, or running your life uh, um, away from the club. So, uh, so that has changed. I think, I'm not too sure what's happening in other countries, but definitely in the UK, that, uh, that is a, a bigger thing now, much, much more prominent uh, uh, for me anyway, people coming into the club and helping them. The only thing I have issues with is like, it's the same, it's, um, are they truly independent? If a lawyer firm comes in, if an accountant firm comes in, are they really doing it just to kind of help them or are they trying to see, uh, um, gauge who's gonna make it and maybe have them as clients later on? I think there's a little bit of that as well. Um, so that's the only gray area I feel, but at least they have, you know, people coming in and, and, and giving them kind of um, uh, the right information. I think for me that, you know, that you're always going to have the agents. Um, you need them to a certain level. I think it helps if you've got a really good agent who, who is forward thinking, who looks after your entire kind of, uh, your, your, the, your sphere. And so you're in the middle and, and they look after everything and make sure that's sorted and the future's sorted. You save some, you spend some, things like that, good investments. Um, you know, th that's what you want to be in. I think at 17, 18, I think they should all have uh, a sphere kind of um, uh, look at themselves and make sure everything's uh, done. Some may start at 17, 18 and might not make it. They might, they might kind of fall out of the game at 25, but some might go on to 35. So you've got to, you've got to you know, plan it for everybody so everyone's secure. Uh, I think in the past, a lot of players didn't have that and almost thought it, were, it would have just, you know, the money would just keep on coming in. And I think some players still think that as well until, you know, they don't get no contracts and things like that. So, but then flip side of that, it, it, there is other issues coming in and, you know, someone might get married, get divorced and things like that, blah, blah, blah. So that all comes into that as well. So you can't, some things are so, unforeseen and you just have to kind of get on with it and uh, but I think if you can get them early and get them educated early and the UK was definitely England have, have, have done you know wonders in that sense uh, especially in the academies and it, it's changed they've got a lot more uh, information a lot more help now uh, I'm not too sure in South America I think it's still kind of um, I, I'm not sure I can't really uh, um, you know vouch for them but for England, it really has changed. It's, you know, from 10 years ago, it's, it's uh, chalk and cheese now. Thank you very much for that question. I'll take one over here. Hi, Sol. Um, towards the end of your career, you spent a season at um, Newcastle, which is my team, and you're sort of quite famously one of the last players over 30 that a Newcastle manager was allowed to sign. So I was wondering... <laughs> it's all changed now, isn't it? How did you find your time at the club, and also how important Tough. do you think it is to have control as a, as a coach or a manager over things like recruitment? Um, what do you mean control? In the sense that what, he wasn't allowed to pick any more players, or...? Well, as in, so sort of after Chris Hutton left and Alan Pardew came in, it mm. was sort of a case of the head scout and the chief executive pick. The Power has, is in. gone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, mm. I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, not every club's got it, but obviously it's most, most, most of the big clubs. Your, that type of scenario was already existing in the rest of Europe. Um, and we were kind of uh, almost... Um, isolated in, in that kind of uh, in that kind of world and we were insulated as well now with all the foreign investment and foreign buyers and foreign kind of you know mentality that has seeped in some of it's been good and some of it's been kind of a bit uh, abrasive to to the traditional way of of, of 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 running a football club I think you know, now we're kind of used to it that, you know, if you go to a club, there might be a sporting director, there might be a CEO, there might be a chairman. So you kind of have to accept it. It's, it has come from uh, uh, Europe, the mainland Europe, and it's, it's in, in the UK now, and I think it's here to stay now. So you just got to get on with it now. Uh, I think the guys in the beginning were probably like, it's kind of hard for them because, hey, I want to control everything. Um, you know, the day, like, someone like, say, Arsene Wenger 
you know, for him to go to another club, he can get another club, but I don't think he's going to have that entirety control of everything. So even he would have to get used to sh sharing power. Um, I think you just have to accept it now. It's, it's, a, part of, it's a part of football now. Um, the quicker you get on with it, uh, and, uh, the qu and then you flip it, then you have to be... You have to be friends. You have to find ways of negotiating and things like that to get your own way. So football has changed. It's more. It's changed in the way you, you're not controlling everything, but it's almost you've got to be very clever in in how you speak and how you how you kind of communicate. Um, and and now that's a lot more now in football. Now you've got to be able to master that way of, of communicating to bring people on your side. You can't be isolated, I want to do this, I want to do that. It, it's got to be all encompassing now. Those days are gone. You, you've got to learn how to build within the team. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, you do well. Then slowly you can have a little bit more power as time goes on. But in the beginning, you have to get in, fit in, uh, morph in so you can fit in as well. Um, you've got to be astute at that as well, and then get on. And that's, the, that's, the, that's football now. You know, there's, there's not many clubs with no sporting director. I mean, low you go, yes, but championship above, is, there's always a sporting director, CEO, and then the chairman, and then owner, and then directors. So you've got to be able to handle all that and, and, and uh, keep everyone happy. If you keep them happy, you can stay in a job a little bit longer when, when things are sticky as well. Thank you very much for that question. I think we've got time for one last question. Just over here. Hi, Saul. So you touched Hi. a little bit on the importance of um, ownership um, in football, with City and Liverpool sort of stri um, striding ahead and going for dominance. Um, in light of Kroenke's recent t takeover of 100% of Arsenal, um, how do you see Arsenal's chance of catching them if he continues with the sort of ideology of not investing his own money and going along just... Um, is that gone through now? I don't know. Yeah, is that so definitely gone through? So, so Uzmanov is gone. He now has 100%. Um, mm. The AST have also been forced. And then he's, to sell and he's taken over the uh, few shares of the um, I don't know, one or two percent or whatever. Exactly. And so he's he, taken over everything. And Uzmanov was was frozen out largely um, due to the strategic position of the board for a long time mm. to not let him invest. Yeah, so I know that. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you see Arsenal closing the gap? Even, because from my perspective, even having no matter how good the manager is, if your resources are going to be limited. Mm. Uh, well, he's definitely going to take it off, not offline, but he's going to definitely um, take it off. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, he, I think he said it, it's going to be better. That's what, he, you know, uh, that's what I've heard. That it's, well, I'll take it over and it's going to be, you know, better now and uh, we're going to be challenging. Um, I don't know, some people, you know, it's... A lot of clubs. You, you, what can you do? You know, if it's um, if someone takes over and gives, you know, Uzmanov, he's given Uzmanov the right payment. Uzmanov couldn't really do much. You know, he, he's um, second, you know, uh, shareholder in in percentage wise. He hasn't got a seat. Or, you know, what can he do other than just watch his investment? He's made a lot on his investment, but um, you know, I'm sure he, in the past, he would love to kind of get involved a bit more, but, you know, that's not happened. And uh, people say, you know, Conky is, he, he wants to, you know, invest and, 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 and build a really top team. So I think now you just got to, it, it's like watch and see and how it all pans out over, over the next year, two years and see how it works. Um, that's all you can do. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, we'll be having a short, very, very short meet to speaker session afterwards, so I know there were two questions here which didn't get asked. Uh, I, I can arrange for that just shortly after, but if you could thank me, for, uh, if you could thank Saul for his time uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you. So in, in the final week of term, we've got uh, on Wednesday.